Welcome back, AP. All right. So I know it got a little intense there at the end of class as we were trying to go ahead and like you know give Artemisia her due because I wanted to represent feminine artists at the very end of the Renaissance. Olivia, you did a great job. I was very very impressed. Right, literally just like parabolic blood when Judith was beheading Holy Fearnes in that super intense and very albeit sad representation of women's roles during the uh, Renaissance period. Right now, the big thing though going forward is we were starting to talk about exploration, which is another thing that's occurring during this time period in European history, right? We talked about this already. Uh, during the European historic periods of the 1490s, the 1500s, and like continuing into the 1640s, you're going to be seeing the Renaissance, exploration, the growth of overseas economies, and the Reformation all happening at the same time. Now, in the exploration unit, I'm going to teach you a lot of stuff, but I'm only going to test you on the big thematic parts of it, right? So going with it, though, we left off talking about how the Europeans for the longest time were just technologically locked out of being able to expand into the trade markets that existed in the monsoon marketplace, right? They had no ability to access this region. Oh, wait, no, stop it this region of the world, particularly this country where the spice trade existed that they wanted to get to, right? Now, the Portuguese right there are going to be the very, very first people that actually get heavily involved in the spice trade itself, right? They're going to do this by trying to say, you know what? I know that there is a huge Muslim empire right here. There's a Muslim empire right here. The Mongolians have now gone Muslim, so I can't go this way. So I only have one route to get to India anymore. And that is they're going to go all the way around Africa, right? So the plan is, is that they're going to have to find a way to go all the way around Africa. They're going to use their caravels. They're going to sail against the wind, and it is going to take a ridiculously long amount of time to actually pull this off, right? So some of the earliest voyages really only made it to some small island chains that actually exist near Portugal, right? One of them including the Azore Islands, which were discovered under the patronage and, like, financiership of Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, right? Remember, he never actually became a king himself. He wanted to try and do his country justice by funding exponential explorational growth, right? So he wanted to use the motivations of gold, God, and glory and find a way to give Portugal the ability to spread their faith, make their money, and become the most dominant trade group in all of Europe, right? So the big thing they want to do, though, which they have to conquer, is they do have to go, of course, sail against the wind. So they're kind of sailing in like little like zigzags right now, which is very, very time-consuming, and they are going to begin to create trade posts and forts and plantations all around the coast of Africa. And the early items that they begin to get involved in and make more money for future exploration has to do with gold and slaves, right? As we talked about with the monsoon marketplace, gold, slaves, and salt happened to be the big trade items that the African kingdoms provided to the entire world during the monsoon marketplace time period, aka the Middle Ages for the Europeans, right? So the Portuguese are going to begin to try and take advantage of the African markets, and they're going to begin to delve in some of this gold. They're going to begin to buy up slaves as well from Africa, effectively creating the slave trade network that is going to grow and expand and even infect North and South America. And this is all in the pursuit that they hopefully will be able to find and access even more money through India via spices, right? So going forward, though, this is going to start off as slavery and sugar for the um, Portuguese, right? Now, what I mean by slavery and sugar, right? Their gold is an accessible mineral that the Portuguese had the ability to go to Africa, trade certain wares, trade the Africans guns or weaponry or technology that the Europeans had access to, particularly the tribal Africans, and actually pick up things like slaves, maybe some pieces of gold, right? Now, the big thing that the Portuguese are going to get heavily involved in, though, is using that slave labor in an agricultural sense, right? As we know, you just need to remember this going forward. We talked about this in the Renaissance as well. Large base plantation economics did not really 
jump off until the 1600s. Because typically when you think of slavery-based agricultural economics, you are immediately reminded of North America and the slavery systems used here, particularly in the American South, right? Well, the Portuguese didn't do that. The Portuguese started creating sugar plantations, right? Sugar was a very hot commodity during the late 1400s going into the 1500s because sugar can be used to make a plentiful amount of different items, including sugar, of course, molasses, rum, and a lot of other different types of chemical, well, not chemicals, but a lot of different types of commodity-driven goods, right? So slavery, because of the influx of African slaves now, is going to begin to pivot. Remember, the origin of the word slave comes from the European word for people from Eastern Europe known as Slavs, right? So the word Slav would eventually become slave, trying to reference the poor people from Eastern Europe around the Black Sea territory and how they were the original slave base for Europeans, especially during the Renaissance. But now that the Portuguese are creating a trade network going around Africa, slavery pivots from being Black Sea Europeans to Africans from Africa, which is an absolutely terrible turn of the event history. How about just no slavery period? How can, we, can we just get behind that? Now, so the big thing about it is the Portuguese are going to seek more money, though, right? They are making money through their gold, of course, right? They're just their money. They're also making it off slavery. They're making it off sugar. But they have the ability to quadruple the profits earned by just getting to India, right? which they're still working on doing. They still want to be involved in the spice trade network inside of India. That is still where their, their hyper-commitment lies, right? And a lot of this is due to the fact that at the time, spices were the most sellable, highest influx, biggest capital-gaining good that the world had ever seen. There were other items that made a ton of money, like teas, silks, luxury items like porcelains, but spices were different. And this all has to do with supply and demand, right? Spices like black pepper, allspice, cinnamon. Uh, well, ginger is not te technically a spice, but along these lines, right? Cayenne pepper and all the other spices that go into the spice family all come. Cumin? I think cumin is a spice. Sage, a lot of different herbs and all these other goods that Europeans wanted to access. They all grow natively in one particular place. And a lot of that is on the Deccan Plateau of India, right? Now, given supply and demand, since everyone wants these spices so badly and they are the mark of distinguished people and the foods of which they eat and the foods they want to preserve and the medicines that these spices could make, that means they were in high demand. But the issue is the supply for them is very low because they only grow in one place. So yes, you can have slavery. Yes, you can have sugar. Yes, you can be bringing in gold. But those three things have a plentiful supply, but the spices do not. So since because of this low supply, the price on them is astronomically high. So with the money they were gaining from slavery, sugar, and gold influxes as well, they could triple that payoff with spices. But they have a huge problem. Whenever you get down to this region of Africa, off the Arctic coast, South Africa, being so far south, is subject to a huge amount of storms, a huge amount of wind, and a huge amount of natural barriers, right? So much so that the first guy to try and round that area of Africa, a man by the name of Bartholomew Diaz, tried to navigate all the way around it. And he did successfully make it past, but he referred to it as the Cape of Storms, right? Because he was like, the Cape of Storms will be the things that destroys our boats, but he is going to be the first person to be like, look, once you round the Cape of Storms, India cannot be that far off, right? But Bartholomew Diaz never actually made it to India. The first guy to make it to India is going to be a man by the name of Vasco da Gama, right? And here is Bartholomew Diaz. Of course, you can see his navigator imagery with his astrolabe and also the caravel in the background. Why are you like this? Uh, wait, stop. You stop that. Quit that. All right, so anyway... You can see his navigator details. Uh, there we go. Yeah. But the big guy that's going to be the first one to make it all the way past is this dude right here. Vasco da Gama, right? Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese sailor, is going to be the very first one to make it all the way around 
the Cape of Storms, and successfully all the way to India. He bounces here, he hits Madagascar, he bounces back to the like Eastern African coast, hits here, hits in Yemen, makes it successfully to India first, right? First Portuguese person to ever make it all the way there. Now, there's a lot of crazy stories about what happened when he got there. Apparently, he sent a gift basket of heads and feet to a um, general, or not a general, but a governor of a Indian state because he was like, I heard that y'all are Christians and I heard Christians weren't that nice. And so he was like, oh, okay. And he apparently went out into the, <laughs> into the water and captured a bunch of their fishermen and killed them and cut their heads off and their ears and their hands and their feet and sent a basket of them to the governor as a warning that if you don't let us inside, we're going to destroy you. And apparently that's how they first got their first spice load. But also funny enough too, uh, when he was on his way back, he had four boats of 170 men and he actually didn't make, I think only like half of his crew made it back because a lot of them died of what a disease known as scurvy, right? And scurvy is when you have a lack of vitamin C in your system. But due to the fact that he lost a lot of men, which means he doesn't have to pay them, when he gets all the way back to Portugal, the spices sold on Vasco da Gama's journey to India and back again was enough to fund spice voyages for years to come, right? They sold for a boatload, Get it? All right. Yeah, it's good stuff. I know. It's hilarious. All right. So anyway, but keep going forward, though, right? The big thing about it is now we're going to see the growth of this Portuguese empire, right? Now we're seeing the growth of this Portuguese... Oh, wait. No, hold on. I have completely forgot something, right? Jumping back to Vasco da Gama. He was the one that made it successfully past this area known as the Cape of Storms. But since he was the one that did that and they set up a successful Portuguese trade network all the way Af around Africa, the Portuguese renamed this part of Africa. Instead of the Cape of Storms, they began to call this area the Cape of Good Hope. And if you could get around, excuse me, if you could get around the Cape of Good Hope, then India was right there on the other side. So the Portuguese are effectively going to create a trade network that goes all the way around Africa, right? And when they get to India, they're going to become the suppliers of all things Eastern back to the Europeans, right? And the way they're going to do this is by allying with local Indian rulers, and threatening to harm other ones, right? But as you can see right here, there it is. There are, these are the Portuguese settlements all around India. Now, key thing to notice here, though, is there are no internal Deccan Plateau areas being taken over by Europeans yet, right? And I believe Vasco da Gama made it all the way around, uh, made it all the way around the Cape of Good Hope and back again by 1497, five years after this guy shows up, right? So funny enough to understand is that the Portuguese were in a race, all right? The Portuguese were in a race with their Iberian Peninsula neighbors right next door, the Spanish, right? The Spanish, of course, being under the leadership of Isabella and Ferdinand at the time. The uh, They are the Castile, I think they're the Castiles, right? The Castile family, yeah. So being under their leadership and we had the growth of their power seen in the Spanish Inquisition and the Reconquista, which is something that you should definitely look back over again because we might have like a little review game soon coming up about that stuff. But really, in the long run, with the growth of Isabella and Ferdinand's power and the fact that they see Portugal, their next door neighbor, growing their navigator, uh, navigate, navigatorial abilities, their cartography abilities, which is the science of map making, and the fact that they're very aware that they are going to make it to India at some point, the Spanish decide we need to find us somebody that can also find a route to India so we can beat them first and try to get involved in this spice trade market, right? Now, big thing that's going to end up happening, though, is they are going to eventually hire this dude, right? That, of course, is apparently not Christopher Columbus. Now, the big thing about it is some of you are going to be like, oh, but I thought it was definitely him. I've seen that picture before. We don't even know if this is what he looks like, all right? Like, so this is the most popular image seen of Christopher Columbus, but we don't even know what Christopher Columbus looked like, right? Because we're not positive if this is him or not, okay? We have some of his writings. We have testaments from his brothers. We have testaments from Isabella and Ferdinand about his growth. So we know that Columbus was a person in history and an influential one, albeit kind of an idiot. Uh, like he definitely, though, no one had any clue if this is actually him or not, right? So this painting is slightly disputed. But Christopher Columbus, this is his ugly signature too. 
Christopher Columbus, though, uh, big, big deal, okay? Now, if we were in class together right now, I'd have my board up and be like, all right, somebody tell me what we already know about Christopher Columbus, right? So let's take a second and let's like kind of dive deep and just talk about the things that we already know about Columbus that we don't need to go over again here in class, right? We have a lot of dinky ones that we already know. We're all like, oh, and by the way, if you don't know this fact already, you need to write it down somewhere. And it's like, oh, Columbus is going to sail for India in 1492. That is true. 1492 does serve as a pretty important date in history as it becomes the time period where Europe, Europe finds out, or they didn't find out immediately. It's going to be the time that Europe hits the Americas, right? They, ironically enough, though, didn't find out until 1504, over 10 years later, that they were two brand new continents. Most of the Europeans thought they were just jumping around out in the, like, in Southeast Asia somewhere, or thought they were in Japan. Yeah, so anyway, but big important items to understand are that he does end up sailing in 1492. He takes three vessels with him. Isabella and Ferdinand are going to be the ones that fund his journey. Uh, but that's usually really where a lot of people's stuff stops, right? The important items also, though, we need to go further, okay? So if you already have the important things of 1492, Isabella and Ferdinand, Nina the Pinta, the Santa Maria, which no one on an AP test is ever going to ask about. Uh, but the big thing is that you know that his biggest motivation was to find a route to India. Because remember, if this is the Portuguese route, right? If the Portuguese are going all the way around Africa to get there. The thing about it is that Columbus, when he begins to sail, leaves Spain thinking, oh, if I head this way, because no one knew this was there, then he was just going to pop up on the other side of the earth over here and land in this area, right? Thinking that he could then island hop his way all the way to India, right? His idea was going to be, he was going to say, okay, I'll go here and 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 I'll go, all right? His idea was to go around the world and show up on the opposite side, right? But unfortunately, what ends up happening is, and he actually ends up landing in the Caribbean, okay? So also, that's another thing. If you thought America was discovered by Columbus, it wasn't, all right? The, he didn't land in Plymouth or Jamestown. He landed in the Caribbean, right? So the big thing going forward, though, is let's talk about his motivation. Like, why did Columbus want to be this guy that Isabella and Ferdinand gave all this money to so he could go off and try to find this route to India, right? Well, first and foremost, he's Genoese, right? So he's from Genoa. Remember earlier we talked about there were two rival Italian states that were trying to be hyper-involved with the growth of trade networks in Europe going into this monsoon marketplace time period? Well, yeah, it was Venice and Genoa. And Venice ends up being the one that comes out on top because they created trade agreements with the Byzantine. And then when the Byzantine gets taken over by the Ottomans, they've created trade networks and trade embargoes with the Ottomans, right? So they were the exclusive suppliers of all things Eastern, like silk and teas and uh, textiles and printing and black powder and spices and all that stuff to Europe in the first place. But remember, no one wanted to buy Venetian goods anymore because they were so expensive, okay? So Genoa decides, we got an idea. Let's be the ones that help or aid another country in Europe in finding this route to, uh, like, India, right? Well, ironically enough, it wasn't the Genoese government. It was just Columbus that came up with this idea. It's like, oh, for my Genoese pride and people, I am going to discover this new route to India so we can tell the Venetians they eat it, right? So... But the big issue is he then goes to the Genoese government and they're like, this is the dumbest idea we've ever heard. We're going to focus on like Black Sea trade and that's what we're going to do. He was like, mm. and then he goes to Pisa and asks them for money. And they were like, no, no, thank you. And he finally, after getting turned down multiple different times, does actually receive funding from Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, right? After actually being denied once and then coming back again and being like, please. And so he is the first person that is considered a wave of these people known as conquistadors, right? Or Spanish conquerors, okay? Now, the big thing to understand as well is the agreement that Columbus and Isabella and Ferdinand are going to have with each other, right? The big agreement was, look, Columbus, we're going to give you boats, and we're going to give you the stuff to get there. We're going to give you a crew. Then you got to understand, oh, my God, these people are, my family is blowing me up. Like, 
absolutely blowing me up. They think that like Laura's going to blow us away and we're going to be fine, right? So the big thing is though, after this original, they were like, Columbus, if we're going to give you all this stuff, we get 90% of whatever you find, you get 10. Is this not yet another flex by Isabella and Ferdinand to grow their power as one of these new monarchies during the Renaissance period? Yes, it is. They show the they try to unify the Christian people in their country by pushing the Muslims and the Jewish people out of Spain. They then also try to continue to suppress the Catholic Church authority by then like going after these new people known as conversos with the Reconquista and the Spanish Inquisition, right? So the big thing about it is they now see in their idea, they're like, look, if we if we give him these three boats that we just have sitting around anyway and a crew and he finds some stuff, we can make more money than we possibly know what to do with. So this is a gamble that they were willing to take, right? Now, when Columbus lands in the Caribbean, make sure you know that. He lands in the Caribbean. He eventually encounters these people known as the Taino, all right? So, wait, hold up. The Taino, right? He actually interacts with the Taino people, right? And the Taino people were people that were spread all over the Caribbean islands in either Cuba, the DR, uh, what is now modern day Haiti, the Bahamas, this entire area, okay? So when he actually meets a bunch of the Taino people, when he actually gets there, he thinks that they're Indian. So he calls them Indians, which is not the brightest thing that has ever happened either. They don't even look Indian and none of them were wearing clothes because the Taino people lived in a Caribbean in a very like temperate climate. But then I guess, like, do we really blame Columbus, I guess, in the long run? Because Marco Polo thought he was going to see people with chest faces, right? So, like, in the long run, I guess we don't blame him too, too much. But to keep going forward, though, when he meets these Taino people, he actually had thought he was going to end up meeting the Great Khan, right? Now, the Khan is the king of the Mongolians, right? He thought he was going to land over in Japan where the Mongolian influence existed in China and that the Great Khan would be waiting for him on the shores. The king of Mongolia being like, good job, Columbus, for making it all the way here. No. So when he met the Taino people, he was a little bit confused, right? And he actually ends up enslaving a huge number of them and also ends up <coughs> ends up accidentally spreading disease to them as well, right? Mainly the indigenous people of Hispaniola. Now, while he's there, though, and he's trying to deal with these Taino people that live there already, he does adopt this policy of conquest, right? And the other really, 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 un like, really crazy thing that happened is some European historians have heard the claim that when Columbus met some of these Taino people, that he looked at them and their royals were wearing golden jewelry, particularly necklaces, earrings, and adornments made of gold. And Columbus was like, hey... Where'd you get that? And the Taino people eventually, after a lot of discussion, interpreting, and trying to figure out how to understand one another, eventually parlayed that to Columbus that, oh, we have a little bit of gold, but not much. But the people over there, pointing towards Mexico, have a ton of it. Now, we'll get to like who he was talking about or who the Taino people were talking about when they were saying those people over there, but we'll get to them in a second, right? So he planned on meeting the Great Khan. He adopts this policy of conquest. He begins to enslave the indigenous people of the Hispaniola. And unintentionally, he brought with him diseases that they had no idea that they were carrying. So you have to understand this for hundreds and hundreds of years. Europeans were heavily exposed to a disease known as smallpox, right? Smallpox was one of the biggest killers of the natives in the Caribbean, also in North America, okay? Because they had no immunity to it whatsoever. Because smallpox comes from domesticated animals and a virus that mutated from them to human beings. And it's not just smallpox. The measles was another really big one as well. So was the flu, right? Now, all the while, so he is now enslaving them, adopting a po policy of conquest. He's also allowing violence to be committed against these people. There are a ton of different stories. Some of them completely untrue. Some of them true. I like some of them that are really intense because apparently they're just easier to talk about. So there's one, for example, that speaking of this enslavement, when he saw the people wearing the gold jewelry, he was like, I need to get my hands on every bit of gold because 90% of that gold goes to Isabel and Ferdinand. 10% goes to me, right? So he decides to tell the people of Hispaniola, 
go out and mine gold and find it for me. And he gave them bells to hold. He was like, you fill this bell with gold. And if it comes back anything less than full, he would have their hands cut off, right? So the colonists that he brought with him were also just as bad, though. He couldn't stop them from committing violence against natives. They got really, really out of sorts. The colonists that were, the, the people on the boats that he brought with him, that Columbus brought with him, were thinking to themselves that, oh, when we get there, there's going to be this land of opportunity and money to be made and da 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 When the money starts going back to Isabella and Ferdinand and to Columbus, the colonists begin to freak out out, right? So he didn't necessarily commit a huge amount of atrocities against a ton of the native people himself, but he allowed, he allowed violence to occur from the people that he brought with him, right? There's one guy actually later on in one of his later voyages, or not Napoleon, but Columbus took four different voyages between 1492 and 1504, four separate voyages, right? And on one of them in particular, he was being such a terrible leader of the colony of people that he had left in the Caribbean to deal with the Taino, mine as much like resources that they could find, and set up a colony that when Ponce de Leon actually went to see the colony that Columbus had created, he was so disgusted with it because it was just allowing all these violent atrocities to be committed that he went to Florida to try and actually set up a colony there. And there's the story that he tried to find the Fountain of Youth, but that's not necessarily true. Now, but the big thing is, is a revolt is going to break out in the colony and a royal investigation is actually going to see Columbus get arrested and he is returned in chains on his third voyage, right? So he gets arrested and actually loses an extreme amount of his money, right? Control of his discoveries eventually pass on to the Isabella and Ferdinand, and he loses, he dies pretty much poor, right? Columbus dies in his bed from a fever after his fourth voyage to the Americas, thinking China was right around the corner and only gaining back a small fraction of the financial riches that he found in the places that he discovered. <sighs> Sorry, I just talk about that guy a lot, right? Now we've got to finish up a little bit talking about some of the later explorers, right? But one of the later explorers that are going to show up, it's not just going to be Columbus himself, but his running into the Caribbean is going to be a major key marquee point of the shift in the dynamic of European political economic structure, right? Late explorers are going to include the Dutch, right? So the Dutch are going to start showing up, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that they were beginning to rebel against the Holy Roman Empire, right? So the Dutch, the Netherlands, was inside the Holy Roman Empire. And during the early 1500s, late 1400s, they begin to rebel against the Holy Roman Empire to create a country all their own that you now today refer to as the United Provinces of the Netherlands, right? So that area, while they were rebelling, the Dutch were also establishing a trade network, trade shipments, boats of their own. And so they begin to actually explore this area, the Molucas Islands that are actually down here in the area of Java because they also were home to a huge amount of spices as well. And they also could grow certain things like coffee and other goods that didn't necessarily grow in Europe, right? So let me... Now, the Molucas Islands, the Spice Islands were beginning to be explored by the Dutch. And then this guy, that is not his actual picture. I'm pretty confident that's just another picture of either Diaz or De Gama. But that's not the right picture. Uh, but the, he actually looked like this. Yeah. So, Amerigo Vespucci. Then you also have Amerigo Vespucci, who is going to be another kind of JV-related uh, European explorer. Not a varsity-level guy. He's kind of like some of our other Renaissance humanists, like... Boccaccio and Brunei and Alberti and Ficino and Mirandola and all those guys. Vespucci is important and he actually looked like this, but his importance is actually he's a cartographer. And following Columbus's voyages to the Americas, America Vespucci is the very first one to do to write letters back to, ironically enough, Piero Soderini, the guy who was in charge of Florence while the Medicis were gone and who actually was in charge when Machiavelli was learning all of his ideas. Uh, he actually wrote some letters back to him being like, dude, these aren't islands. These are two new continents that we didn't know existed. And he was the first one to realize that. And since he was the first one to realize that the Americas were two huge new, huge new continents, they named the Americas after him because he is Amerigo, right? So, and then this thing sign shows up, right? The Treaty of Tordesillas, right? The Treaty of Tordesillas um, is going to show up because there was going to be an issue that was going to break out, right? So just so you understand, Portugal and Spain are two Catholic countries.
countries, right? Now, on this world map, the Pope could not handle the idea that two of his countries could possibly end up going to a trade war because that would end up losing him money, right? So if that is where the Vatican is located and the Pope is located, you got to understand, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, we'll get into the Reformation, the Pope is kind of a, re a reflection of the economic gains of Catholic countries, right? If an economic if a Catholic country during this time period is growing economically, that means that the Pope is making money because it all relates to the tithe, T-I-T-H-E, the tithe, right? And the tithe is the donation to the church that individuals, countries, governments, that every person that was a Catholic practitioner had to give to the church every week at mass, right? And it's usually 10% of your income. So that is means that if Portugal and Spain are both Catholic countries, if they're making a ton of money, then the Pope is taking making a ton of money. So the Pope decides to make a treaty that does this. And he gives this side to Spain and this side of the world to Portugal to prevent these two from going to war with each other. That's why Spain never got involved in the spice trade because they were more focused on creating an overseas empire on this side of the world under this new treaty known as the Treaty of Tordesillas, right? So this Treaty of Tordesillas, actually written by Alexander VI, the guy that came uh, right before Julius II, um, was signed by Portugal and Spain and written by the Pope. That line that it established was known as the Line of Demarcation. Fun fact, though, later on when they actually went back and looked at it, as you can see, the line wasn't drawn properly, and it cut the tip of Brazil off, right? And so the Portuguese actually made some colonies right here, closer to Rio, modern-day Rio, and that's why Brazil speaks Portuguese instead of Spanish, because they had the ability to colonize this tip and then infiltrate into the rest of Brazil, right? So I think this stuff's super interesting. Now, going forward, though, Magellan... Is so anyway, sorry about that. I had to wait for the announcements and stuff to finish up, but I'm going to be done real, real quick, all right? Then you're going to see another later explorer, also Portuguese. This dude is actually by the name of Ferdinand Magellan, right? So Ferdinand Magellan looks like this, right? Ferdinand Magellan is going to be considered in European history. Notice I said considered, and I put a lot of spice on the end of that. He is considered the first piece in European first person in European history to circumnavigate the globe, which means he started here and he went na 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 doink na na doink na na doink na na and then he went all the way around this region and then came up and popped out on the other side and went na 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 doink na 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 Philippines ah! all right so anyway because here's the thing that actually happened Magellan actually died in the Philippines right when he actually hit the Philippines um he tried to introduce Christianity to the native Filipinos and then they 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 made him a lot shorter if you if you understand what I'm saying they kind of did like did away with this part of his noggin and he's going to actually end up losing his head but his voyage itself does end up making it all the way back around the earth right so Magellan's voyage actually was the thing that went all the way around even though Magellan himself died now fun fact though about uh, Ferdinand Magellan he's also the reason why the Pacific Ocean is named the Pacific Ocean because when he got around the <clears throat> Excuse me. When he got around Cape Horn, C A P E H O R N, which is the bottom of South Africa, he again saw so many storms coming through here that he thought his voyage was going to sink. Even though, ironically enough, he dies in the Philippines. Uh, but when he actually passed through, he said that this area, this sea, this ocean was so calm and peaceful that he named it the Peaceful Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. Right. So. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, then, so you have to understand, Magellan is going to be credited with navigating the entire world first, but he actually didn't because he lost this general part. Um, then early French and English explorations are going to begin to explore and try to discover some stuff in North America, but these do not go very well, mainly due to the fact that they were dis uh, the French began to explore Canada in the pursuit of fur trapping and beaver pelts, right? That is how they tried to make their early amounts of money. And their like earliest explorations do not grow at all. And England doesn't even make a permanent colony in North or in North America until the 1600s, right? Particularly in 1604 with the colonization of Jamestown. Pretty sure it's 1604. It's 1604, or like 1609. It's in that general region somewhere. Now, early French and English explorations do not go well. They of course only make money off two things: fur trapping, and then also 
codfish, right? Turns out that North America was stocked full of this fish that was very, very plentiful and very abundant and a lot of Europeans like to eat a lot of, but because of overfishing in Europe, they kind of started to run out of it. But this codfish was all over the North, um, North, Amer North American coast, so they began to fish for a ton of cod and that's how they made some of their earlier money. So bang, that's exploration going into Columbus and post-Columbus, right? And then in the next one, we're going to talk about how the Spanish begin to kind of infiltrate into North and South America, particularly under Cortez, and then also under Pizarro. But I'll talk to you guys about that later. Y'all have a good one.